Hi, engineers. In this video today, we're going to be talking about the formation of urine and mctrition. So if you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up, comment down below. I love reading all your comments, and don't forget to subscribe. And then check out engineer.org. That's where all of our illustrations and notes for every lectures that we put up here on YouTube are available for you guys to utilize and study from. So let's go into how we talk about the formation of urine. What's going on? How does blood all of a sudden become urine? And how does that happen? So let's quick run over what we're looking at right here. What we have here is our nephron and we have our blood supply. So if you already watched our blood supply to the kidney video, you're gonna recognize what all this is. But real quickly, we have here our afferent arterial, right, and our efferent. Okay, then we also have our glomerulus, right, and that's where we have this little capillary bed. which is really important because this is where all of our exchange is occurring. So in our renal corpuscle, we have our glomerulus and then we have our Bowman's capsule. And with all that in there, we eventually get little bits of our filtrate. And the filtrate is going to go all the way through our nephron into our collecting duct and eventually become urine, right? But as the blood filters out of our glomerulus into our efferent arterial through our peritubular capillaries, there's also some exchange that occurs there. So what we need to do is just understand how this all occurs, right? So with our glomerulus, where our first step in our urine formation is our glomerular filtration, right? So our glomerulus has a lot of different processes that's gonna go through. I'm gonna touch on that in a different video. But there's fenestration op the openings, there's lots of different things that it needs to go through different channels. And those little particles that are, and mo molecules that are gonna be able to go into our filtrate finally get into our tubule. So those are things like amino acids, uh, creatinine, our water, our electrolytes, glucose. And as they get into our filtrate is when we have our glomerular filtration. So glomerular filtration is essentially occurring here. And when we talk about glomerular filtration, we also want to think GFR, right? What is our glomerular filtration rate? Do we remember what that range is that we need to know for the NCLEX? It's about 90 to 120 milliliters per minute, right? So every minute we have that occurrence, right? Once that filtrate makes it in to our tubule here, we are in what portion of our nephron? We are in our proximal convolute tubule, right? And we go down here through our loop of Henle, up our distal convolute tubule, and then our collecting duct. So that filtrate eventually makes it into our proximal convolute tubule. What happens then is people get, start getting a little confused as to tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion. So when I remember this is tubular reabsorption means there's things in the tube, right, our filtrate that wants to get back into our blood. So when that occurs, right, we get the pink marker over here, we are having our second step. And you want to think of it as we have concentrations, right? We have homeostasis within our body. So there's always just checks and balances. And as that filtrates in here, sometimes our body is like, oh, I actually think I want a little bit more of that back. So I'm gonna, you know, take it back. It's gonna go back into the capillary bed. But because there is that checks and balances from that tubular reabsorption, then there's also tubular secretion. And the tubular secretion is essentially what's gonna go in to our nephron into our distal convolute tubule to our collecting duct and get secreted, okay? So sometimes we give away too much and we gotta, or we don't give away enough, we gotta get rid of some more, so we start putting it back in to our nephron, back into our distal convolute tubule, our proximal convolute tubule, it's happening all over here. And essentially, we create our filtrate and our filtrate is gonna keep traveling on down through into the collecting duct and eventually, once that filtrate leaves, it becomes urine, right? So, it's a very easy, basic portion here of how 
urine from the glomerulus makes that filtrate, then there's this constant back and forth of reabsorption and secretion through the loop of Henle all the way up until we get to our collecting duct, right? We eventually get urine. And what is a normal range for an adult to be urinating? That's the one we need to know. 30 milliliters per hour, right? 30 milliliters per hour is at least the, the minimal, okay? And you're thinking, well, we have the formation of urine. How do we actually urinate? How do we actually pee? So let's talk about that now. All right, let's talk about now mictrition. How do we get the urine that we've now created to come out of our body? And hopefully in a way that we are able to maybe control it, maybe not, let's see why. So first we have in our bladder, right? We have urine that starts to accumulate, right? So say we're somewhere around approximately 300 milliliters in there. We're roughly around half full is what we're gonna be thinking. So as we get a half full bladder, right? We start to get pressure on the bladder walls, right? And our detrusor muscle, this smooth muscle that's around the outside of our bladder starts to expand a little bit, right? We start to feel this distension, this, this pressure that's starting to build up on the walls of the bladder. The word that we use for that is distension, right? And so our patient is going to have an increase in distension in the bladder. So because of that, there are receptors on this wall, right? On the bladder wall, and they start to signal. They're like, hey, we're getting kind of full in here. We maybe should evacuate. So if you look down here on this bladder, we get that increase of pressure, right, on the bladder's wall. So we start to get distension. That starts to send a sensory signal right here into our sacral. Our sacral region is able to give another signal to our bladder wall and down into our internal sphincter, right? So we start to get messages sent. These messages that are sent go right here, right? And they tell us, all right, our bladder needs to relax, or sorry, our bladder needs to contract, so we start pushing out urine. So our bladders contract. It's also gonna tell us that our internal sphincter here, so our internal urethral sphincter should relax. So it's telling us, hey, your bladder's getting full, you need to get rid of all this urine. But we don't pee. We don't pee because our internal urethral sphincter is a involuntary control. But our external, the one that's a little lower, is able to be under voluntary control. So the reason we don't go and like pee ourselves during our exams while we're at our desk, you know, it's a three hour exam, you're just holding in that urine. You're not peeing your pants there is because you have an external urethral sphincter and that you, your external urethral sphincter needs to be able to control voluntarily. And why, how does that work? When we have this, we also have information that gets sent up to our pons, right? We have a pontine micturition center and our pontine micturition center is like, hey, we need to pee and it goes to our cerebral cortex, and our cerebral cortex is like, that's great, I, I note that we need to pee, but we can't pee right now, because we are in the middle of an exam. So it sends a message back to the Pontine Victorian Center, and it says, yo, we're not peeing yet. So because of that, it inhibits the relaxation of the external urethral sphincter. When we finally get to the bathroom, and we're saying, hey, I gotta pee, and now it's time to pee, now we send that, that signal gets turned off, we are able to then go and say, all right, now I can release or relax my external urethral sphincter. And because of that mechanism, we are then able to urinate. Okay, makes sense, right? So we are able to urinate, produce our urine, and evacuate. Emptying our bladder, we leave a little bit behind. There's always a little bit of residual but it's important to note that with this messaging, right, and this constant uh, sensory between our bladder and talking to our brain, is that there is a potential for a lot of different injuries along the spine up into the brain that can interrupt that signaling, right? So I want you to understand that there is involuntary control with our internal 
right? And then voluntary control for our external. And that is essentially how we urinate in a very, very watered down, uh, easy to digest micturition reflex. So I hope that made sense. I hope you understand now how urine is formed and also how we are able to urinate and have control over that. And then if there's any interruption in this pathway or our brain is underdeveloped and not able to comprehend this pathway, then we have some issues with leaking or peeing our pants or anything like that. And you also wanna think about those pressures, especially if you do have to pee and then the pressures are increased in the bladder. So if you wanna think about women who have a smaller urethra and that internal urethral sphincter is already relaxed and then you sneeze, right? And all of a sudden there's an increase in pressure in the bladder and that would pee a little bit because we couldn't control that external for a second. We have so much pressure, it just pushed right through. So I hope you learned something from this video and as always, until next time.